All right, we'll call the meeting to order. The time is now 6.30. Um, can we have roll call, please? Ms. Morris absent. Mr. Pollock? Here. Mr. Wright? Here. Mr. Lopez? Here. Mr. Young is absent. Mr. Sheridan? Here. Okay, uh, first item on the agenda is approval of the minutes for June 28th. Can I get a motion? I'll make a motion to accept the minutes as is. Second. That was Daryl and uh, uh, Mr. Wright. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Second item on the agenda is approval of the minutes for August 23rd, 2016. Can I get a motion? So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Who was that? Bill um, Sheridan and Lopez. All right. That motion carried. Okay. The there's no um, the uh, let's see. Uh, the next part is public comment. If anybody here is wishing to speak on any items that are not on the agenda tonight, um, feel free at this time. Seeing none, I close public comment. Um, we have a, uh, the next item on the agenda is a public hearing. Um, if the applicant could come up and uh, talk about their project a little bit. Good evening. <clears throat> My name is George Veely. I reside at 301 Carolyn Drive. Uh, I'm working with Veely and Associates, and t this evening I'm representing A. Duda and Sons and the Vieira Company on the uh, redevelopment of uh, their headquarters property on Aloma Avenue. And with me tonight is Aaron Hannes Archie with uh, A. Duda and Sons and Cass Servons with our planning and engineering group, SK Consortium. So hopefully between the three of us we can answer any questions that... Uh, aren't uh, covered in the staff report. Uh, but this, uh, as you're aware, A. Dude and Sons has been in the communities probably for over 100 years and uh, looking forward to redeveloping their headquarters at some point in the near future. And um, look forward, to, uh, we concur with the staff report and, and we've worked long and hard over the last year to put all the information together that is in your packets this evening. So I'll be available for any questions you might have. Thank you. Are there any questions of the applicant? Mr. Chair. Mr. Wright. Um, just a couple items real quick. Um, in the, the PUD, a couple of the items that you guys have requested has the, a change to the parking ratio. Yes. And, and to the building heights. Um, the parking ratio, you indicate there's 70 a 70-unit townhome. Um, do you know what the distribution is between three-bedroom and four-bedroom type units, uh, or one one car garage, two car garage at this point? We do not have that level of detail at this time. We're, we're talking with uh, several um, townhome developers, and uh, A. Dude and Sons does have a home building subsidiary, so they may self-develop. But uh, I'm sure that. We'll, we'll provide adequate parking. Uh, we just didn't want to overcommit, and we thought that uh, that uh, what the staff had suggested was a little overcommitment, so we suggested a slightly lower level, which I think in our explanation that was included in the packet, I think that has a history of, of being adequate. So No, understood. I guess my, my question is, is, is more along the lines of, um, you know, the current land development code in subject to review or being as it's being proposed at this moment I think we asked for um, parking spaces on site one whatever the number of bedrooms is minus one plus like a, a 0.25 ratio for the for the visitors part I don't necessarily have a problem with reduction of the visitors part but the, I'm concerned about the mandating only two units two spaces per unit you know if you have a four bedroom unit and you've got to only put two car garage in there or two cars in there um to me that could be a problem um and i'm, I'm trying to understand what the logic is there why what's the objection to to using the the formula of of the number of bedrooms minus one in this case um, i would assume under under more circumstances that anything above three bedrooms potentially is going to have a two car garage or 
But that's kind of why my subject, my question. Um, well, I can let uh, my planner speak to a little better. He's more knowledgeable of, of you know, townhomes that have been developed. Uh, I think uh, uh, there aren't too many four-bedroom townhomes, and that might be the. the well, again, I, I I differ in a sense because I know there are some because I've been in the business and I've, and I've done them that way, so I know they exist. And it's been mentioned in that you would have either one or two car garages, you know, potentially in there, and that's kind of where I'm just trying to get the breakdown because if we if we, if we mandate that you are allowed to only put two spaces on there, it doesn't matter what the bedroom count is at that point. It's only going to be two bedrooms. So um, and it seems like the the issue is with the visitor parking, you know, that ratio, and that's why I'm, I'm trying to distinguish between the two. Like I said, I don't have a problem with the visitor parking, but um, having lived here in Oviedo, I've lived next to townhomes, and typically with a, a two-car, one-car garage and a parking in, typically what happens is, I find that the homeowners don't want to park behind each other and they park on the street or they park somewhere else so that they have free access to their one driveway and one garage. So, um, and if we do that with more than two, you know, two, four bedrooms or, or you know, more than three, I just am trying to verify why, why we're looking at that issue. And if you had a two bedroom, I guess there'd be one parking space. Well, yes. I think probably average. Correct. The two bedroom for us with the zoning in progress, you need a minimum of two parking spaces. I mean, that's, that's our minimum. Anyways. Yeah, the two, minimum is two. two. Regardless of the of the space, I'm just I'm just really trying to find out what the objection is to using the formula of one bedroom less than what's uh, you know the townhome is. So. Let Cam speak to it. Needless to say, that was an issue we been a lot of time talking about it. Understood, but this is obviously the first time that we've seen it, so my, hence my question. So, <laughs> My name is Cass, last name is Suvong, with SK Consortium. Uh, at this point, we don't know the, the makeup of the one bedroom, two bedrooms, or three or four. Uh, typically, for townhomes, we have done quite a few. Actually, one in Oviedo called Biltmore. Most of the time, it's two bedrooms. Every once in a while, they, they the developer put a mix into it, three bedrooms, hardly four, because of the type of product that uh, townhomes, usually young couples or older couples without kids. Uh, two bedrooms in, for built mode, for example, that we use it as part of our justification is that, like you said, there's opportunity to either widen the, the driveway to 16 feet, park two cars on it, one in the garage, but outside, a lot of time people use the garage for storage a lot of time. Or uh, in Biltmore's case, some of the driveways are longer because of the corner lot. You can park two, three cars on it, the photograph on your package. We uh, look at the national uh, parking study that was done by ITE. Uh, Institute of the Transportation Engineering, they did the study for townhomes, and the conclusion is less than two per unit. So I think it's, it's a little, we ourselves, I, I know, do that when they develop this, they want to have enough parking for their guests too. So at this point, we don't know the mix. That's why we propose to be two, space per, two spaces per unit. Does the, does the formula of, of as you said, I mean, if the developer came in and decided he put no more than three bedrooms, the, the ratio that the city still has established or is in the process of establishing of having to require two spaces, Perfect. well, three, whatever number of bedrooms minus one, that ratio would still work for you then? Yeah, we would like to be the one to add parking space to it, not, you know, uh, Per code that has not been adopted yet, you never know what's going to change after. Understood. Okay. Well, again, I, I thank you. Are there any other questions? Not this time. Um, I think the the second one I had was you know obviously relative to the building heights in a sense like that. So yeah, the, the building heights we we wanted to uh, uh, have the opportunity to perhaps try try to attract a hotel to a, a mixed use development. And uh, many hotels would require a little higher 
uh, building height than otherwise. So, and we've proposed it only for that tract that is farthest away from the uh, the residential development that's in the county. So it's in proximity to a lot of existing commercial. It's central to the park, and if we're able to to uh, snag a hotel, we wouldn't want to have uh, either have to come back or have a limitation that might uh, negate that opportunity. So, so we had proposed a hotel just for the, uh, or I mean the 75-foot uh, height restriction for parcel three. Which, which is, I'm, I'm sorry, which parcel three is that the that north be, of the access road, or is it south? It'd be north of the access road and uh, east of the uh, north of the pond there. Okay. Parcel two fronts on a Loma. Parcel three. In okay. Visions, uh, All right. Thank you. A couple of buildings. Any other questions? No. All right. Um, staff want to. Give me a second. Just look right here. It's on page two. Actually. Staff report. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This is a request to amend the city's official zoning map. To change the zoning district of approximately 42.34 acres from Seminole County Industrial MI and Agricultural A-1 to the City of Oviedo Plan Unit Development. The subject property is located on the east side of State Road 426 and approximately 918 feet south of West Mitchell Hammock Road. The property owner is A. Duda and Sons Incorporated and the applicant is George Beely of Beely and Associates Incorporated. The purpose of the zoning map amendment is to change the existing Seminole County Industrial and Agricultural Zoning Districts to the City of Oviedo Plan, Plan Unit Development Zoning District consistent with the medium density residential and commercial future land use designation. On October 15, 2007, City Council adopted a future land use map amendment for the subject property from Seminole County Industrial and Low Density Residential to the City of Oviedo Commercial and Medium Density Residential Future Land Use Designation for the subject property. The existing Seminole County Industrial and Agricultural Zoning Districts are not consistent with the subject property city's future land use designation. Therefore, a city zoning district consistent with the City of Oviedo Commercial and Medium Density Future Land Use Designation must be established on the property. The applicant wishes to designate the subject property with a plan unit development zoning district consistent with the existing commercial and medium density residential future land use designations. Land Development Code Section 4.6 C and D require the review and approval of a development agreement and a conceptual development plan with a PUD zoning map amendment. LDC Section 4.6 C2 requires a development agreement to be included as exhibit in any ordinance adopting amendment to the official zoning map which changes the zoning of a property to PUD. The applicant has submitted a development agreement and conceptual development plan for inclusion into ordinance number 1638. The subject property consists of 42.34 acres and measures approximately 1,888,330 square feet. The site com contains approximately 20.10 acres of wetland. The applicant will impact and mitigate the wetlands. 8.80 acres of wetland will be used for wetland mitigation and conservation. The proposed development will consist of commercial, re retail use, office use, and a maximum of 70 residential uses, units. The commercial uses shall consist of a total of 8.16 acres with a 0 0.3 FAR professional office shall consist of 8.367 acres with a 0 0.5 FA and residential shall consist of 70 attached single family units at a rate of eight dwelling units per acre. Commercial parcels one and two will follow the city's C2 zoning district. Office parcels three and four will follow the city's OC zoning district. The proposed zoning is compatible with the adjacent zoning districts. The proposed development will consist of the following, which this information that I will go over as we go through the presentation was taken from the development agreement and the conceptual development plan. The maximum height of building structures shall not exceed 75 feet on parcel three. On parcel two, they shall not exceed 60 feet. And on parcel one and four shall not exceed 50 feet. 
And the maximum height on building, build, maximum height of buildings and structures on parcel five shall not exceed 45 feet. The majority of the heights are consistent with the approved um, resolution 3118-15, which is zoning in progress that was approved by city, adopted, excuse me, by city council on December 7, 2015. BUDs are allowed to be flex, flexible and may not, may not always comply with the terms of the city's land development code. When they were considering the proposed height for the different parcels of development, the following rationale was considered. Parcel one is located north of a vacant property for which Seminole County has approved a 55 lot single family residential subdivision, which we call Lucas Landing. Given the proximity, proximity of parcels one and four to the proposed subdivision, the applicant is proposing a lesser height than the 60 foot maximum zoning in progress height. The applicant is proposing 15, 50 feet on parcels one and four and parcel five at four, 45 feet in height, which is consistent with the city zoning in progress for townhomes. The applicant is proposing 75 feet on, the par on parcel three. The applicant provided justification for providing 75 feet for, for the 75 foot building height, which I will summarize um, from this report. While it's not an anticipated that any buildings will be constructed to 75 feet taller, the additional 15 feet in height allows for additional flexibility, particularly since the A, Duda and Sons Incorporated new headquarters may be located on parcel three. The Andrews Crossing PUD could be also used, could also attract the hotel, which is another land use, which the maximum height building is a critical factor. Additionally, modern architecture tends to incorporate higher ceiling places in its design, and the modern building exterior features are expressively proportionate with three distinctive masses for the building basis. Typical floor and rooftop features. The floor-to-floor -floor dimensions tend to be higher in Class A office buildings such as corporate headquarters, offices. High ceiling features can be found in interior open spaces, especially on the ground floor level of new high-end buildings. These spaces generally form atriums, lobbies, or other public gathering spaces. Modern architecture also emphasizes rooftop features. The rooftop floor office unit or penthouse office spaces are distinctive and command premium rent. Extra ceiling height is needed for flexibility and design. Also for the southern edge of um, parcel three is more than 160 feet away from the edge of the nearest residential development. The additional 15 feet in height will not adversely impact the surrounding areas. The surrounding, par air par surrounding parcel three is described below. North of parcel three, they have described that it's a general contractor's office and self storage facility. Par east of parcel three, Andrews Crossing PUD designates stormwater pond, recreation tracts and conservation areas. And south of Parcel 3, Andrews Crossing PUD and Access Road and Designated Office Parcel 4. And west of Parcel 3, Andrews Crossing PUD Parcel 2, commercial, with a maximum height of 60 feet. Um, also in the development agreement, they refer to the architectural standards. Um, the, they have agreed with to comply with the architectural standards of the city's land development code. However, the developer is requesting that brick or stone veneer will be allowed as finishing material for all development within the project. Also, landscape and buffering. Developers shall plan one medium tree on each residential lot. For non-residential lot, landscaping shall comply with the city code, which they have incorporated, um, shall have, include A1 buffer types along the perimeter of the PUD and along the interior space, parcel lines between commercial and office. The A2 buffer shall be provided between the commercial and residential. The applicant also proposes a C1 on the perimeter and a 15 foot wide buffer on B1, a parcel one and parcel four adjacent to the residential. Um, per the zoning in progress, the requirements are that they should have um, one large tree or one medium tree and one palm tree on the tom townhouse lot. The applicant proposes one medium tree, and the applicant not provide, again, a justification for pro providing one medium tree, and I will um, summarize that again. The width of a town home lot is usually 20, to 20 feet to 25 feet. As such, planning a canopy tree within, within the smaller area is neither productive nor recommended by industry standards. Canopy trees require 40 feet to 50 feet spacing to grow properly, and dense canopy casts too much shade onto sub-canopy vegetation below. 
This limits the growth of other plants and weakens the health of grass lawn areas. Furthermore, tree planting in smaller confined spaces is potentially damaging to the surrounding driveways, curbs, sidewalks, and underground utilities. The applicant also has provided, um, which I stated before, uh, per perimeter buffers for the project, and additionally, the applicant complies with the city's land development code and buffers requirements for the individual parcels. Also in the development agreement, the parking, the applicant will, has proposed that the townhome parking is provided at a rate of two parking spaces per townhome. The required par parking, if townhomes may be satisfied by one enclosed singer, car parking garage with the driveway designed to accommodate at least one parking space on the portion of the driveway within the boundary of the applicable lot. Parking for non-residential use is not addressed in the development agreement and shall comply with the city's land development code in effect at time of the development agreement. The city's LDC does not provide for parking requirements for the townhome. Zoning in progress proposed on-site parking for townhomes to be calculated as a number of bedrooms minus one with a minimum of two parking spaces per unit. Guest parking is calculated at 0 0.25 parking spaces per unit. The applicant also provided a justification for this. Um, he, they provided a typical townhome unit has either a one or two car garage, depending on the size of the lot in the unit. It is common for local government to require townhome developments to have at least one car garage. Townhomes are popular among small families, younger or older married couples and unmarried couples. Usually one or two parking spaces are sufficient for residents of townhomes. Conversely, larger families with three or more family members generally prefer single family dwelling units with not only one more parking space, but also a larger yard area for pets and children. The standard townhome unit is typically constructed at a lot approximately 22 feet to 25 feet wide, which is also generally the width of the unit. Unless the alley is provided, the enclosed garage is normally street facing at the front of the unit. The 22 feet to 25 lot width can accommodate a 8 foot single wide or a 16 foot double wide driveway. As a result, one, one to two additional cars can be parked off the street and in the driveway. Also, they stated that they, although we anticipate that guests and Visitors will park their cars in the respective townhome driveways or on the streets before looking for designated guest parking. The development's agreement specifically accommodates guest parking. Smaller townhome communities, as proposed for Andrews Crossing, oftentimes provide additional parking near common areas such as clubhouses, mailboxes, and maintenance offices. We'll go to signage. The applicant proposes to have signage on the property um, to have one project interest sign. It's a freestanding, mo freestanding monument sign. The sign shall not exceed 70 square feet and 12 feet in height. The sign will be located within tract A or within an easement on parcel one or two, uh, parcel one or parcel two. Parcels sh parcel shall also be allowed to erect their own freestanding sign and wall signs in accordance with the land development code. Parcels one and two, if further subdivided, each subdivided parcel shall be permitted a freestanding and a wall sign wall signage in accordance with the LD the LDC. For the LDC, the maximum number of signs the development is allowed is a total of seven signs, two of which would be multiple furnished signs for parcels adjacent to State Road 426, and the applicant proposes to place one additional sign on the subject property. There is adequate water, sewer, and drainage capacity to serve the proposed development, and the proposed development project has a driveway connecting to State Road 426. I just take a second if you can look at the screen. Um, this is, a, for the record, a correction that was made in the staff report that there's only one access, but there's actually two access points, which are both on State Road 426. There are, there's a north and a south. The south will be um, have a full intersection, whereas the north will be right in, right out, access a point, and they're all on the north side of State Road 426, so they will have to access. State Road 426 is identified as a minor arterial roadway and within a development corridor per the, per the city's comprehensive plan, per policy 2-2.41 of the two, of two, 2025 comprehensive plan. In Table 2.1, Criteria for Provisions and Mobility Strategy Proposed Net New External PM Peak Power Trips, a proposed development, 
which requires five mobility strategies for 400 to 599 trips. The applicant is required to incorporate five mobility trips, but had proposed to incorporate nine, but only five of them will be um, implemented. And out of those, out of the nine, five of these were permitted, so they have one that they would have a bus drop off, um, bicycle racks on parcels one, two, and three, and they shall exceed the, uh, they should have one additional four space um, bicycle rack, and they also should, will do that for parcel five, but we'll have an additional four space bicycle racks. Um, they will have bicycle access from state roll 426 to residential parcel five and recreation track C by either a designated bicycle lane, bicycle lane on the north side of track A or by a 10 foot wide multipurpose pass for pedestrians and bicycles. Um, they will have signs also a, a decreased speed limit that is five miles per hour less than the permitted posted speed limit. And they will designate gathering spaces with outdoor seating and tables to serve the office, which is office will be on parcel three and parcel four. They'll have benches along, enhancing pedestrian experience by providing the benches. They will provide a sidewalk with a five feet on the north side of track A, which will be one foot wider than what is required by the land development code. And then they also designate carpooling spaces on parcel three and four. The city attorney reviewed the subject development agreement for legal content and found it acceptable. City council will conduct a public hearing on Monday, October 3rd, 2016 to consider ordinance number 1638. It is recommended that the local planning agency recommend the adoption of ordinance number 1638. Thank you and staff is available for any questions. This concludes the presentation. Are there any questions of staff? Mr. Chair. Mr. Wright. Um, go back to the, again, I'm going to revisit the parking again. So uh, I'm, I'm specifically now on page 64 of our um, of our package in the PDF. That is page 64 in the PDF. Um, this is actually in the... Uh, the way the agreement is written, the, the draft version of our development agreement for Andrews Crossing, um, specifically section four under building and development restrictions, item E for what it talks to residential on parcel five. Is everybody there? Wait till everybody gets there. Can you repeat that building restrictions? Four yeah, building it's, it's, restrictions. It's on, um, it's section four, it's the building and development restrictions, mm -hmm. and it's item E. Under residential. Residential, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, everybody there? Mm -hmm. um, about halfway through the paragraph, um, it talks about the maximum density of not exceeding eight units, but then it says each unit shall provide two parking spaces. The required parking of townhomes may be satisfied by a one enclosed single car parking garage with a driveway designated to accommodate at least one parking space on the portion of the driveway within the boundary of the applicable lot as opposed to the driveway apron which lies in the right of way but it goes on to say that in lieu of the one parking space on the portion of the driveway within the boundary of the applicable lot as noted in section 11 the second space may be accommodated by a separate designated area off so we've we've reduced the in what would go to council at this point, we would reduce the requirement from our zoning in progress from minimum of two parking spaces or one less than the number of bedrooms plus a 0.25. And now we're, they've asked for two only and a 0.1 offsite. But in our agreement here that we're going to council, now we're saying they don't have to put the one driveway space in the, uh, um, on the property, it can be designated off-site for townhomes, and I'm confused why that sentence is in there. They are still required to provide two parking spaces per townhome, and that's in the development agreement. It says each unit shall provide two parking spaces. One of the, one of the required parking spaces can be provided um, off-site is what that says. So they can 
they are still required to provide at least two parking spaces plus the guest parking space. But one of the two parking spaces can be provided off site. Okay. How do we um, how do we uh, how do we enforce that? I mean, how do, how is that? I guess my question is is where does that come? Where, where do we use the checks and balances for that? Uh huh. Actually, we discussed that with the applicant, um, and actually it doesn't make much sense because the setback that they are proposing is 20 feet. So if the setback is 20 feet, you have a driveway that would accommodate a car, even if you have one, only one parking garage. But they insisted that they wanted that as flexibility. But in reality, the setback would already require them to have 20 feet of a driveway since they are doing a front-loaded garage. So in reality, you will have a minimum of two parking spaces on site. I mean, the setback would no, be I, I agree. unless... I'm just, I'm just trying to understand why that sentence is in the, we in the, the in agreement that goes to council. And yeah. you, you have the opportunity, if you like, to make changes, make recommendations to it, so that it says what the board would like for it to say. So if you want both parking spaces to be provided on site, you would make that recommendation. In our site plan review, they would have to show, if they w by any chance show a, a parking space outside of the site, the, the, the lot uh, uh, perimeter, that would have to be designated. So we, we would have to count, you know, two parking spaces per unit, additional to the uh, guest parking. So. We would, they would have to show that. That would be the, the, the checks and balances. The, the site plan would have to show two parking spaces. If they are not on site, they would have to show uh, on the, on the streets or in another designated area. In the, the zoning in progress kind of allowed in, in, uh, for pocket developments to have a, a common a parking area for residential development if we want to go in a situation that you have uh, townhomes, but it's so, you know, it's really a, a, a small development that you would have a common area for the parking. So we kind of allow that. In this sense, I think the setback already would not, you know, if it's a front-loaded garage, right, and I, it's not clear also in the development, but I don't think they will go for a, a real loaded garage because then you require an alley, right, it would be more land. If it's front loaded and if the setback's 20 feet, you already have a parking space in front of the garage. So, is this is this in lieu of one parking space? Can this be combined with the point one that we're required? You know, based on what's being proposed before us, if you know that that 10 percent above and beyond the minimum required parking spaces of 140. Can they be combined as the same thing? Can they take that no, because and designate those as, you know? The guest parking, can they designate the guest parking as the... Re in as lieu the of the... No, the yeah. they would have to come back and amend their development agreement to yeah. say that. Okay. And you guys are comfortable with this language? It's, we're comfortable with it. It's not what we're proposing with the zoning in progress, but because it's a development agreement, it is allowed to be a little bit more flexible. It does not have to comply with the land development code. So it's a development agreement. And um, we're, we're, I think we're pretty much comfortable. They would it. comply with the code if they come with three bedroom or anything up to three bedroom, right? They would comply because the- sure. Anything that's, more. That's what I said. Yeah. yeah. It's above three that they would yeah. create. Um, I mean, I'm not trying to change the wheel here. I'm just, you know. <laughs> Uh, understand <clears throat> Mr. Sheridan just staying on that to help me with the rationale behind switching we have zoning in progress we have rules in place but yet again now we're looking at changing rules that we have I understand that they can be changed with the development agreement but why what was the rationale behind not pushing this issue a little bit more? I'll go a step further or add a little bit more. I think everybody is being naive, I think is the best word, if we think this is going to be older families 
and not so many cars moving into the city of Oviedo. Um, I live in a new town home community and it is lots of young families with lots of people, with lots of cars, with people looking for cars. I'm not saying there needs to be three or four spaces per lot, but I, I think this is grossly underestimating what type of person, what type of family wants to move to Oviedo. The, the, the burden of proof is on the applicant. Um, we make a recommendation. Um, development agreements, as I mentioned before, they're allowed to be flexible. So we tell you, the board what the land development code requires as well as what the zoning in progress requires. I would ask the applicant their rationale for it and um, allow them to explain it again. And if the board isn't comfortable with that rationale, I would recommend that you add additional language to the development agreement. Gentlemen, again, George Veeley. Um, some of the rationale here, I think uh, Cass referred to it initially, or one of the things was the uh, ITE uh, study. Uh, I, I used to be a traffic engineer in a past life. And I can tell you that uh, the ITE manual, when they did their parking for townhome study, there were two studies done based on two different kinds of townhomes. One was for uh, uh, rental townhomes, and the other was for uh, condominium and uh, regular owner-occupied townhomes. In the case of the rental units, and this is based empirically on probably a sample size of perhaps several hundred townhome communities. And the recommendation was on the rental units, 1.7 parking spaces per unit. And in the case of the non-rental townhomes, 1.4. And what we're providing here is 2.1. And uh, there could be a rare instance of a lot where maybe a curvature or something clips and we, we want, would like to have the flexibility to perhaps move it's off-site in the context of off the lot, but it's within the townhome community that that parking space would create it. Um, the PUD process is a thing of give and take. One of the things we gave on at the staff's request w was heights below what your zoning in progress calls for. So, so it's a give and take. It's not, you know, all take and no give. It's, it's, it's supposed to try to accommodate both sides and... Uh, this is a request we made, so I, I hope that uh, based on the empirical evidence provided by the ITE studies, uh, um, I personally think that 2.1 is more than adequate. And, uh, um, and as you go up from there, I, I think it's overkill. And some of, the, you know, some of this is offsets. You know, on the one hand, you want more parking, more impervious surface. On the other hand, you'd like to have more canopy trees. How do you get all this stuff, you know, in one place? Uh, some of these things are conflicting, and there's and there's compromises involved. Uh, the Dude organization, uh, there's going to be a good product out here, probably a, as good a town and community as, as you've seen in this city. So, um, again, I think there's a little give and take. This is one of the things we 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 propose. So hopefully. Uh, I think the staff is satisfied that the safeguards are there. I hope you'll agree. Thank you. Are there any other questions of staff? Mr. Chair. Mr. Wright. Um, moving from parking, a um, couple other items. The, the, the strategies for the mobility, there was nine proposed, but they're only required to do five. Um, my question, and I apologize, I just have 13. to get, thank you, get to the page. Um, still back where I was at. Um, I guess, I guess, 12 for 15, us, 15. If that's what you're yeah, it's page 15. From the development agreement. Yeah. Um, We're required, they're, obviously they're required to implement five. Um, just simple thing, you know, two and three look like they're almost identical, they're just separated. Um, 
I'm just I'm just looking at it while while there's nine there, and I and obviously I appreciate you know them providing as many strategies as possible. But you know if you take the same one and split it up twice, and the path of least resistance is that I've done the same thing, and I really haven't impl I've only implemented four, not five, in a sense. So um, I'm not really looking for an answer here, other than uh, again staffs. Recommendation here is that do these nine strategies, you know, at this point satisfy the city is that they're going to meet the requirements when this eventually would get approved? Yes, sir. Um, last question: uh, traffic. Uh, there, this is you know one project now that we come before us that there is a uh, significant increase in the number of trips. Um, and really, the in, at least from a report standpoint, you know, it was our report basically says it's been reviewed and said it was fine, you know, by our, our traffic. I'd kind of like to like a little bit more information if, that's, if you can provide it at this time. Um, uh, do, we, do we know what the current level of service is on 426? We can get that for you. Thank you. Okay, the level of service now is an E. I'm sorry? 426, the level of service is an E. 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 And in layman's terms, that is, <laughs> you know, if I, is A good, B, you know? It, it, e is the, just the capacity that it can hold. E so e, e is, you know, E is a, is a level of capacity that it can hold. And I think Cass would probably be able to speak more to it um, in terms of the traffic. Cass is not a traffic engineer either. <laughs> okay, so it's a minor arterial. Minor. What it is is a, it's a minor arterial. And the level of capacity, it tells you the number of trips that it can hold, that that roadway can hold at one time. So when it becomes an F, it means that it's failing. Right. So it's an E right now. Um, it's not failing at this point. But um, I don't have the capacity numbers. It's an F dot um, capacity Buzz, buzzwords number. Buzzwords for me, I will tell you, is that, you know, basically our staff report says our city's transportation consultants reviewed the applicants and concluded that there should be adequate. Mm -hmm. It doesn't say there is. And um, the there's, there's a, that's a, that's a big, that's a big difference for me um, under the circumstances. I don't, and again, now that applicants come back up, um, do you have any plans for a signal at that intersection? No. Okay. Uh, uh, our entrance is on 426. Uh, whatever we do even to improve the intersection, uh, the driveway intersection there, we need to get the FDOT permit to do that. Now, let me address the, the traffic study a little bit. Uh, they look at the uh, one-mile radius, two-mile radius out there and how much we impact, not only today based on the current traffic, but only on, also on a projected level of service in the future. And that's how they conclude the, at least that's how much I know, how they conclude the, that, that we're okay. Understood. Uh, um. That area of 426 is not failing at all. The only area along 426 that's failing is from uh, Mitchell Hammock to Winter Springs Boulevard. But the area where this particular um, development is is not failing. 
And then um, what we have in our transportation, in our comprehensive plan, is if um, a project exceeds a certain number of trips, um, then it has to comply with our mobility strategies. And our transportation consultant looked at all the mobility strategies that they provided and um, w approved it. They, they were okay with it. Um, once they leave this step, they have to go into what's called concurrency, which is at the site plan stage. So at the site plan stage, it's a more detailed look at the traffic to determine if there is capacity for each one of the developments. Um, they'll go into that stage, and that's the next stage. At this stage, it's just the rezoning. We do look to make sure that there is capacity, and there is capacity at this point. Um, once they start developing and once other developments come online, it may change. But at this point, there's capacity. Okay. Um, for future reference, I mean, for my personal, it would, when I see the word should, I would prefer to have maybe some additional. Will or shall. Yeah, you know, um, or at least give me some backup data as to why, you know, what my expectations are. Okay. Um, you know, I, I, I Again, personal opinion aside, is that um, I've seen too many instances being in the city for 30 years where we've allowed developments to go in that don't require a signal, don't put anything in. So, and the problem is, is that this is another situation where we don't control the road that the development's going on. Um, you know, example is my subdivision. You know, uh, they allowed all the development to go in, so the solution was they closed my exit. And forced us all out. Right. Forced us all out another exit. That was the solution because we didn't control it at that point. So that's um, why I moved. And that's that's a that's a this is an instance where you know where I don't like the word should. You know nobody's telling me that there's capacity on this. And this is out of all the things that we've seen over the last few years, this is a significant increase in the number of trips of what's currently available. You know in this case it was like 1378 or something like that. So. Um, I would prefer in the future, you know, maybe that when we see something like this, I would almost prefer to have our traffic consultant here at the time. I should have caught it. I should have asked for that earlier, but, you know, in this case, um, going forward. Um, thank you. Sorry. Thank you. If, if I may ask, I may add to it, though, that, that the, the traffic signal there probably not approvable from DOT standpoint. It's just too Agreed. close to the, the other. Agreed. And you I would mean, have to do a you're, warrant you're, study you're, as well. Study. Your, your intersection is, I believe, lined up with the exit, the southerly exit of Home Depot. That's correct. Okay, that intersection now is, is from personal knowledge and experience, is used as a U-turn, you know, um, to get through that facility. So um, you, you, you already have an intersection or a, an access point that's cut in 426 south of Mitchell Hammock that already has a conflicting traffic pattern. Um, and now we're going to add a fairly substantial number of trips, hotel, commercial office, residential, and stuff like that. And, and um, you're, you're putting people in a position, and again, where they're going to have to make a left turn unassisted, you know, through traffic. So um, that is, that is a, a weakness, as far as I'm concerned, in our city that we can't account for. So um, thank you. Any other questions of staff? I'm finished. Thank you. All right. This is a uh, public hearing, so we'll open it up for public comment. And then we'll close public comment. Uh, what's the board's pleasure? Mr. Chair, I make a motion to accept ordinance 1638 as is. Thank you, Mr. Lopez. For a second. We're recommending. I and now we're accepting. Oh, I apologize, but we're recommending. Recommending, recommending yeah. Thank recommending you. it. Thank you. Second, if that wasn't already done. <laughs> Mr. Wright, thank you. All right, is there any discussion? It's all been said. All right. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries. This will be uh, before the City Council on October uh, 3rd, 2016, in these chambers at 6.30. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Good luck with your project. Um, Thank you. All right. Um, next item is any discussion items. Does anybody have anything? Okay.
Can you make the rain stop? <laughs> no. <laughs> My son's up. All right. Um, that being said, I'll uh, entertain a motion to adjourn. So made. That's right. Do I have a second? No, we want to leave. <laughs> okay, Mr. Lopez. <laughs> All right. The meeting is adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Ha, ha, ha.